He was the right person to be in the right place at the right time. Joseph Jowett, 27 years old and not one to be messed with. He stood a towering six feet, four inches tall, weighed 200 pounds, and it was said of him that he evidenced muscular development and not adiposity, which that's an 18th century way of saying he was all muscle. He was captain in the Virginia militia, and he was stationed in the Charlottesville, Virginia area. This is a sleepy area at this time, 1781. The British troops are in Virginia, but they are in Richmond, Newport, Norfolk, the coast. This, Charlottesville, is the upper country, where the colonials in rebellion retreated from areas in, in easy reach of the ravages of the British ships. Virginia troops during the Revolution, its fine militia, had been donated and spared to go elsewhere. The main force fighting with Washington and building the Continental Army. The sleepiness of this area was going to change on the evening of June 3, 1781. Captain Joet is asleep on the lawn in front of the Kaku Tavern. He hears hoofbeats. Hoofbeats deep beating on the dirt road. He's awakened. Looks up. It's the White Coats, a cavalry unit led by Colonel Banaster Tarleton. This is not good. Tarleton is not one of the inept generals in the British command. He's really good, fast-moving, excellent horseman, and his unit is elite. The entire Virginia legislature was at Charlottesville, where Tarleton's appears to be going, including some big people, the ex-governor Patrick Henry and the then-governor Thomas Jefferson and all the state's legislators. No small matter either. Virginia is not just a state. It's the largest state in the United States of America. It's the bastion of continental resistance outside of New England. And Virginia had no troops. Most of its able men were sent across the continent. The Marquis Lafayette was in the state, but he was far from Charlottesville. There's no army here. There's a smattering of posts you know, manned by a few militia, and they have no idea what's heading to them in Charlottesville. The only hope for Jefferson and the legislators was advance warning. Joe quickly mounts his horse, and at about 10 p.m. begins a 40-mile ride from Louisa to Charlottesville, attempting to beat the British and deliver the news. British were moving fast, and that was on purpose. Here is Benester Tarleton's account. I imagine that a march of 70 miles in 24 hours with the caution that I might have used uh, would perhaps give me the advantage of surprise, and concluded that an additional celerity to the object of this destination would undoubtedly prevent a formidable resistance. See, Tarleton is not like the Howes or Cornwallis. He's fast-moving, fast-thinking, aggressive. God knows what would happen if the whole British army would be in his hands. He found little resistance in the Charlottesville area. He even captures a wagon train headed down to Nathaniel Green's forces and sets it on fire. The British cavalry are on the main highway of the Virginia interior. Joint had to take the old mountain road. This is not a neatly cleared highway. It is an overgrown area with a faint path, but it's a space between trees, and the British don't know about it. He's likely traveling with only the light of the full moon. This from a June 1928 issue of Scribner's Magazine. The unfrequented pathway over which this horseman set out on his all-night journey can only be imagined. His progress was greatly impeded by a matted undergrowth, tangled brush, overhanging vines and gullies. His face was cruelly lashed by tree limbs as he rode forward, and scars said to have remained the rest of his life were the result of lacerations sustained from these low-hanging branches. The race is on, but only Joe it knows it's on. Still, Charlton's moving fast, but 
You can't just keep moving an army forever. Tarleton pauses at 11 p.m. for a three-hour rest at the Louisa Courthouse. He begins his march again at about 2 a.m. He encounters that supply train, 11 wagons at Boswell's Tavern. At dawn, Tarleton is reaching the plantations of Castle Hill, Dr. Thomas Walker's home. All of these actions, the wagons, the rest, going to the Congress member's home, delays Tarleton, and Joet is able to outrun him. Joet's route took him through a ford of the Ravana River in the town of Milton. At about 4.30 a.m., he crossed the ford and ascended the mountain on which Jefferson's Monticello sits. At Monticello, Joet awakes Jefferson and his guest, several Virginia legislatures. We know from Jefferson's gardener that uh, Jefferson is an early riser and uh, is in the gardens of Monticello. But what do you do if you're Jefferson and the British are coming? Well, you get out your fine Madeira and you entertain your house guests that you have for breakfast. Hospitality must come first. You send your horse to get new shoes. Joet then leaves Monticello, having warned Jefferson, and travels the additional two miles to warn those in the town of Charlottesville. Now, Jefferson spends two hours after Joet's warning gathering his papers together. Another captain, Christopher Hudson, rides to Monticello to warn of the imminent arrival of the British. He still doesn't go. Jefferson sends his family to Anacorthia, a friend's estate, about 14 miles away. He continues to check Charlottesville with his telescope for signs of the British. By the time he finally sees them, cavalry are already on Monticello's lawn. Jefferson gets on his horse and slips out. Backwoods advantage. He knows these trails. He knows this area well. And Jefferson's also a pretty good horse rider. Joe, it meanwhile, rides to the Swan Tavern owned by his father, where most of the legislators were staying. The Virginia legislatures, these are the people running Virginia, decide to flee and reconvene in the town of Staunton. This is 35 miles west in three days and continue to run the state. Jefferson does not join them. This is a critical decision for what happens next. His term, he believes, has ended. Joe's warning allows most of the legislation, including Packet Chickeny, to escape, but seven are caught. Joe, it's lost to history. We hear so much about Paul Revere, but not Virginia's Paul Revere. Here's a poem that was published in 1909 by the Charlottesville Daily Press in an attempt to get Joe at more attention. Hearken, good people, a while abide, and hear of stout Jack Joet's ride, how he rushed his steed, nor stopped nor stayed, till he warned the people of Tarleton's raid. The moment his warning note was rehearsed, the state assembly was quickly dispersed. In their haste to escape, they did not stop, until they had crossed the mountain top, and upon the other side come down, to resume their sessions in Staunton town. His parting steed he spurred, in haste to carry the warning to that greatest statement of any age, the immortal Monticello sage. Here goes thee, Jack Joet. Lord, keep thy memory green. You made the greatest ride, sir, that ever yet was seen. It was on June 1st, 1779, when the General Assembly of Virginia elected Thomas Jefferson well known for being the author of the Declaration of Independence and a member of Continental Congress. They elect him as the second governor of Virginia. Three candidates, Jefferson, John Page, Thomas Nelson, each secured substantial support. Jefferson earned election on the second ballot. He and his family would reside in the governor's palace in Williamsburg for nearly a year. Before, and he takes this action... The government is moved from Williamsburg, which is too close to the water, to Richmond. And that's why the capital remains in Richmond today. And it would become the Confederate capital during the Civil War. Richmond is an excellent city for defense. It is navigable. That means boats can get in there, but it is the farthest city inland 
that boats can still reach. So it's easier to defend than some of the coastal cities. And it's inland enough so that people can get there and do their law and commerce. And to the General Assembly, Jefferson expressed his thanks, writing, No rewards can be so pleasing as those which include the approbation of our fellow citizens. But he's of two minds about being Governor Jefferson. To Richard Henry Lee, Jefferson privately laments that public offices are what they should be. Burdens that it would be wrong to decline, though foreseen to bring with them intense labor and great private loss. And indeed, his predecessor had made this office. Jefferson is succeeding Patrick Henry, very popular. The Virginia Constitution provided that governors would be elected one year and they could be consecutively reelected no more than twice. So Patrick Henry had served his terms when Jefferson takes office. The Virginia governor's executive powers were minimized as fitting a state, a republic rising against an imperial king. Eight men elected by the General Assembly formed a council of state to assist in the administration of government. This is an archaic concept, but one that was present in many colonial governors and then in state governors. And it was talked about in the Constitutional Convention to do with the president, that the president would be a plural executive. Jefferson understood that the advice of the council controlled the governor, allowing him to proceed on his own responsibility only when no advice was available. Key members of his council included John Page, John Walker, and his good friend James Madison. They met with the governor almost every workday morning. Virginia's at war, and Jefferson maintains during his governorship 1779-1780. He's elected for another year term. Maintains a steady correspondence with Samuel Huntington, the president of Continental Congress, with George Washington, the commander-in-chief, and Horatio Gates and Nathaniel Green, the commanders of the Patriot Southern Army. The Continental Army's making pressing calls upon Virginia for trained soldiers living defense at home in the hands of county militia. Virginia was never like New England. They just couldn't get the system of Minutemen going. Virginia did have volunteer militias, independent companies, and that worked well. But when they tried to form Minutemen units that would be under state command, they got a lot of reaction from the middling classes. Here's what George Gilmer, a friend and physician to Thomas Jefferson, says about Virginia and its ability to raise troops. I know not from what cause, but every denomination of the people seem backward. The convention have altered the name volunteers to that of Minutemen, and behold, what a wondrous effect it has had. Out of near 300 volunteers, there are now how many men men? So few that I am afraid to name them. We were once all fire. Now most of us have become inanimate and indifferent. Late in 1778, a British expeditionary force landed in Georgia and began a southern campaign that would threaten Virginia throughout the time that Jefferson's governor. And a British fleet sailed into Hampton Roads in May 1779, seized Portsmouth, and plundered the Virginia countryside before returning to New York. Another sea invasion was a constant danger. But Virginia's western frontier, and you have to remember, it extends at this time. Virginia's huge, from the Blue Ridge Mountains into the Ohio country. Jefferson sums up the, the state of Virginia in a letter to William Preston, a colonel in the Virginia militia. The governor bluntly confessed that the state was threatened with a formidable attack from the northward on our Ohio settlements and from the southern Indians on our frontiers, while our eastern country is exposed to invasion from the British Army in Carolina. Inadequacy of arms and other military supplies added to the state's woes. General Gates chastised Jefferson because he sends troops to the Carolinas that don't have any arms and are not well trained. So not only was Virginia being demanded, making <laughs> demands were made on Virginia, but they also didn't just want men, they wanted men that were trained and armed. And this required a financially strong government. And even before Jefferson assumed office, there was a shortage of hard money. Taxes paid in paper money did little to increase government revenues. Blockades of exports by enemy vessels really deepened Virginia's difficulties. Finances became even more dire in the autumn of 1779 after the most unfavorable harvest known since the settlement of this country. 
These potential threats become real in 1781 in January when the British fleet landed along the James River southeast of Richmond and then aims for the capital. Governor Jefferson and the Council of State hastily orders out the militia, and Jefferson himself spends two days on horseback, ensuring the safety of records and supplies. The British destroy extensive military stores and then retire to their encampment on the coast. Washington argues, orders Lafayette and 1,200 troops to march south to the aid of Virginia. Thomas Jefferson to George Washington, Charlottesville, May 28th, 1781. And you can see in this letter the urgency of a troubled governor to the general. (laughs) Sir, I make no doubt you will have heard before this shall have the honor of being presented to your excellency. The whole force of the enemy within this state, from the best intelligence I have been able to get, I think is about 7,000 men infantry and cavalry, including also the small garrison left at Portsmouth, a number of privateers which are constantly ravaging. And they prevent us from receiving any aid in the counties lying on navigable waters and powerful operations mediated against our western frontier by a joint force of British and Indian savages have, as your excellency before knew, obliged us to embody between two and three thousand men in that quarter. Should the enemy be able to produce no opportunity of annihilating the Marquis's army, a small proportion of their force may yet restrain his movements, while the greater part employed in detachment to waste an unarmed country and lead the minds of the people to acquiesce. We are too far removed from the other scenes of the war to say whether the main force of the enemy be within this state. But I suppose they cannot anywhere spare so great an army for the operations of the field. Were it possible for this circumstance to justify in your excellency a determination to lend us your personal aid, it is evident from the universal voice that the presence of their beloved countrymen, whose talents have so long been successfully employed in establishing the freedom of the kindred states, that your appearance among them, I say, would restore full confidence of salvation. So there's a lot there. Governor Jefferson is telling him There's an enemy force in the state. We've got no troops with which to combat it. Even the Marquis Lafayette that you've sent down here uh, may be surrounded, in effect, blockaded. People are going to start surrendering, maybe becoming loyalists because they don't see the state of Virginia as protecting their interests. There's not much that I can do. And furthermore, I don't even have any information on where the enemy is and ending it with Maybe you should come to Virginia, General Washington. <laughs> um, a lot there. A few days will bring to me that relief which the Constitution has prepared for those oppressed with the labors of my office and long declared resolution of relinquishing it to abler hands has prepared my way for retirement to a private station. Still, as an individual, I should feel the comfortable effects of your presence and have what I thought could not have been an additional motive for the gratitude, esteem, and respect with which I have the honor to be Your Excellency's most obedient and humble servant, (laughs) Governor Thomas Jefferson. So we've got Virginia's in trouble, don't know what to do, don't know even where the enemy's coming from or when this will stop. Maybe you should come here, and boy, am I looking forward to not being governor anymore. I mean, that's really what the letter says. And thus you have Tarleton's lightning-fast strike. Jefferson makes sure his family's safe. He escapes. He has a retreat in the Poplar Forest property in Bedford County, Virginia. Far. Even the British cavalry unit isn't going to get there. It's too far from their base. He considers himself a private citizen in a republic. He's no longer holding elective office, and he doesn't return to the Virginia Assembly when they meet 
But when they do on June 12th, they elect Thomas Nelson as the new governor. But they also do something else. Well, Jefferson's not here. They pass a resolution for inquiry into the conduct of the executive for the last 12 months. The assembly then adjourns on June 23rd without proceeding with this inquiry and then says they'll renew the subject during their fall session. Nichols is the person who makes this resolution, but it's also supported by Patrick Henry and some other significant Virginians. Archibald Carey, Virginia politician, speaker of the Senate, who knew Jefferson well, writes to him, If I know you, this inquiry will bring you no pain. Patrick Henry believes it's a good way to look at the way the executive is structured and what powers the office has. Jefferson is quite outraged. He writes to Nicholas, who to another friend he calls trifling and an object of pity. He writes to him demanding to know what these specific charges are about his conduct as executive. Why don't you just say them and I can address them? Nicholas does write back, defends his, his ability to investigate the executive. He also notes that this is plural, that notices of the inquiry have been sent to all members of the executive council, not just Jefferson as a single man, and that it's the proper duty of the legislative branch to investigate the executive. It's an agonizing summer for Jefferson. He calls Nicholas a tool worked by another hand. Nicholas was like the minnow, which go in and out of the finament of the whale. Henry was the whale, of course, discoverable enough by the turbulence under the water in which he moves. He felt that Patrick Henry was moving against him and trying to show that he had not been a good governor for political reasons. Furthermore, his defense is going to occur in the, in the document, The Notes on the State of Virginia, his book about how terrible it is, because not only do they meet elect Nelson governor, but many there in the assembly, while Jefferson's not there, talk about having a dictator to run the state of Virginia. And Jefferson thinks this is an outlandish idea that a republic would have a dictator. Like how quickly after your revolution for independence are you going to replicate the British system? It's December 10th, 1781 when Jefferson gets himself elected to the assembly so that he may address it. I mean, that's no problem. He's very popular in his area. And he addresses the General Assembly and answers charges made against his government. And some of these charges are that, hey, did you ask for enough assistance from Washington? Why didn't you mobilize the militia sooner? And he has answers to these issues that he was in constant correspondence with General Washington. And Washington was assuring him of... Uh, where the British were, and also letting him know that there were limitations on what he could provide to Virginia. No one, not even Nichols and not Henry, respond to Jefferson's defense. No one pursues the matter. Two days later, the Virginia Assembly passes a resolution of thanks to Jefferson for his impartial upright, and attentive administration of the powers of the executive, and declared the assemblyman wished to obviate all future and to remove all former unmerited censure. We're sorry, essentially, the assembly says. But there's two things that occur, and one is that the friendship between Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and the admiration that Jefferson had for Patrick Henry that from when he was a young law student and watched Henry make his speeches, it's now gone. These injuries had inflicted a wound on my spirit which will only be cured by the all-healing grave, tells a friend. The other thing that's going to happen is that this will be used against Jefferson despite what the assembly did. Yeah, they cleared him officially. But just the fact that there was an inquiry and a lot of rumors swirling around and Jefferson did nothing to protect the state. This is going to haunt him for the rest of his political career. It's going to be brought up in various campaigns, including his campaign for president. 
Hamilton, uh, during the 1800 election, says that Jefferson made a smug retreat. Now, he does this through a, uh, a pen name, Fosian. He says that Jefferson made a smug retreat in 1776, in 1781, and 1794. Hamilton uses it against him. In 1812, Light Horse Henry Lee accuses Jefferson, this is during the war fever of 1812, of letting Richmond fall. Jefferson, so distraught, spends the last two months of his life pleading with Light Horse Henry Lee's son not to publish memoirs in which these accusations are made. Here's what uh, friendly biographer Thomas Malone writes. His whole procedure was as dignified as that of any wartime fugitive, but the circumstances did not lend themselves to heroic legend, and Tarleton did him the greatest disservice with the timing of his raid. He would have been kinder if he'd waited until the assembly had chosen another governor. No responsible person at the time seems to have questioned Jefferson's own judgment that his term had expired, or to have blamed him for the interregnum that followed, he could hardly have been expected to follow the fleeing legislators to Staunton without a formal request from the assembly, or at least an informal one from the speakers, that he continue to serve in the unexpected interim. Lacking that, he saw no alternative but to interpret the law strictly according to his custom. It would be nearer the truth to say, says Malone, that the government abandoned him than that he abandoned the government. That's a hard one to judge through modern eyes. I mean, Jefferson, in his actions, is strictly following the law then. I'm not governor anymore. My term expired. Not really considering that you've got British troops in the state and they are trying to capture legislatures and, and legislators and, and, you know, ransacking houses and things like this. Uh, perhaps it's time to reconsider those things. It just doesn't lend itself to thinking of Jefferson as an executive. And, you know, can I? Uh, the, Malone's trying to be fair, but I think some criticism is fair as well. So why is this story important to tell? One, I think it's just an interesting different angle on Thomas Jefferson that is usually praised. And this is just a story that was not the best part of his career. Um, even a favorable biographer like Dumas Malone who wrote a series on Jefferson, Jefferson the president, Jefferson the Virginian, etc., says that uh, it wasn't his best moment and maybe wasn't suited for the governorship, particularly in wartime, and perhaps there was some blame to be put on the structure of the governor's powers, that he didn't have the kind of executive powers that a Virginia governor or a president would have today. I think another reason it's interesting to tell, though, is because it's a demonstration early on of a battle between legislative branch and executive branch and the investigative authority of the legislative branch. The powers of a legislative branch to investigate matters, uh, let's say the Iran-Contra hearings, Watergate, or even the current Trump campaign and Russia connection investigation, or any other investigation that the House or Senate might begin there's no one line in the Constitution that says the Congress has the power to investigate anything it wants. It just has that power. The reason for that power is that it's vested in legislative powers. Because if a body is going to legislate, this goes all the way back to Parliament, they're going to have to find out information so they know what laws to pass to remedy the situation. So it's rooted in that, and that's the reason the Congress can order subpoenas and, and the like, put people on and hearings, including members of the executive branch. There's executive privilege, and there's things that can be kept from them. John Kukla, who I had on, who wrote the uh, biography of Patrick Henry, insists that Patrick Henry really had good intentions in mind. He wasn't looking to ruin Jefferson, that he was looking to argue that the office of governor should have increased powers. He felt that when he was governor, and, and there were a few British raids. Though it's hard to 
say that having just retreated from the forest and their meeting again, that they were pleased with what the executive department did, you know, that put their own safety in jeopardy. And that was probably some degree of anger in the inquiry resolution as well. Anger that was cooled over the summer and in December when Jefferson answers the charges. But you see how an executive is a human being and can be annoyed by the charges of the legislature. It would that it be that the investigations are just carried out in a normal basis, no politics. The legislature just wants to investigate things. But there's also a person and there are political power involved. And you saw that immediately with this Jefferson story with him as governor in that he took it personally and it's kind of a cautionary tale to legislators, don't investigate the president or don't investigate your governor unless you want to be accused of politics. So, you know, it didn't go well. And there's always this tension as Congress begins investigations of the president's say between the need to uh, for a legislature to do its duty and for the president to not feel offended or to feel that it's, uh, you know, its authority is being compromised. And maybe we as the public have to look at inquiries and media hearings and not think like it's always about crimes being committed or the president's so terrible and things like that. And since we don't, we have the situation where we're at. If you look at the, I find it very analogous to the Russia-Trump campaign. And there's plenty of reasons to look into why Russians might have interfered with the 2016 election. Well, interfered in, in you know, putting propaganda out and targeting voters and things like that or assisting the Trump campaign, connections between Trump campaign managers and Russians, who, while not an enemy, they're not necessarily the most friendly nation in the world, uh, to the United States. There's plenty of good reasons to investigate that, that are non-political, that are important for a country and for the future, but you can't, then and now, can't remove that political consideration that anything you're doing is also damaging the President of the United States. And in Governor Jefferson, we have an example. <laughs> 